And so we reach the Tuesday of Passion Week. On Sunday, Jesus triumphantly enters into the city of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey with them, putting palm branches in front of him, laying their clothes in front of the donkey, and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. On Monday, he returns in Mark to the temple, overturns the tables of the money chambers, changers, saying, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. Tuesday is sometimes, I sometimes call it debate day. Debate was a thing in the uh, ancient world, and especially in Jewish circles where you, you tried to best the other person in argument. Rabbis sometimes did this. You know, which rabbi could be the cleverest in their particular perspective on something? And so however it starts, and some of it is because Jesus is just a little too significant to the crowds, and the smart people um, come out, the religious leaders, and they want to show, no, really, they understand the Bible, and they really understand God better than this upstart from Galilee of all places. Who from Galilee knows anything, right? Can anything good come out of Galilee, as it says in, in the Gospel of John? And so they come to Jesus with, with questions, challenging his authority, challenging his insight. But before that happens, you might remember that yesterday on Monday, when Jesus started out for Jerusalem on Monday, he finds a fig tree. And in the story, he's hopeful that it will have fruit. But remember, he has bracketed his omniscience. As he will say in Mark 13, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the sun. Jesus did not function with omniscience while he was on earth. That's what the Bible tells us. And we see this in the story of the fig tree, because Jesus sees that the fig tree has leaves, and he goes to investigate, hoping that it has fruit, but of course it doesn't. He didn't know in his limited omniscience, he's, he's put it in a lockbox, he's put it in his divine subconscious. I'm not saying that he didn't have it, I'm saying he did not access it. Um, and so Jesus goes over to the tree, it has no figs, and he curses it. He says, may this tree bear no more figs. Now, when Jesus heads out toward Jerusalem on Tuesday, the fig tree is withered, and his disciples remember what he has said the previous day. Now, before you go thinking, well, what did this fig tree ever do to you? Uh, it's not really about the fig tree, ultimately. Remember me talking about the sandwich yesterday? The fig tree is the bread of the sandwich, and the meat in the middle is when Jesus overturns the table of the money changers. And together, what they tell us is that the religious leaders of Jesus' day and the majority of the Jews of Jesus' day had rejected Jesus and they had rejected God and they had rejected the repentance that John the Baptist had called for. And the, the result was is, is judgment. And the fulfillment of this judgment would of course take place in AD 70 when God allowed the Romans to destroy the city of Jerusalem and its temple. By the way, I'm gonna go ahead and wait until tomorrow to do Mark 13, even though Mark 13 actually takes place on Tuesday. There's not much mentioned on Wednesday uh, in Mark, and so I'm gonna go ahead tomorrow and talk about the, uh, the little apocalypse of Mark 13. Um, but the fig tree embodies, or is an is a illustration of the judgment uh, that is coming upon unbelieving Israel. Well, then we get into the debates. First, uh, they challenge Jesus' authority. By what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus, very, very clever, he says, well, okay, let me first ask you, by whose authority did John the Baptist preach? And of course, they don't want to say, by God's authority, because then Jesus would say, well, why didn't you listen to him? But they don't want to say, from human authority, because the crowds believed that John the Baptist was a great prophet. And so they say, well, we don't know. And so Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to tell you either. And then Jesus tells a parable, parable of the wicked tenants. The wicked tenants, basically a landowner leaves some tenants in charge of his property, and he goes away. And then he sends some people to collect the rent, and they, they don't listen to them. They kill some of them, and of course they kill his son. And it's pretty clear that what the story is talking about, how that God has repeatedly tried to save Israel, how God has repeatedly sent prophets to them, and they killed the prophets. They send Jesus, and what are they going to do to Jesus? They're going to put Jesus to death. Um, and so the religious leaders aren't plum dumb. They know that he's talking about them, and it just makes them even more furious. 
So then they try to debate him into a, a, a problem again. No win situations. Or are they? They say, okay, Jesus, should we pay taxes? They think they've got him in a double bind. If Jesus says, yes, we should pay taxes, then they can say, see crowds, this isn't the Messiah. He's telling you to submit to Caesar. But if Jesus says, we shouldn't pay taxes, then they can say, hey, Romans, here's a guy telling people not to pay taxes. Well, Jesus asks for a coin. And he says, well, whose picture is that on the coin? And they say, it's Caesar's. And Jesus says, well, you better give it back to him then. Um, in other words, pay your taxes. What Jesus does here is he sets up a, a pretty hard and fast dichotomy between the world's wealth and the world's many money and the money systems of the Romans and things like that and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God doesn't involve money. The kingdom of God is completely foreign uh, to money in the way that Jesus thinks about it. And, and so basically the whole idea of money and taxes and things like that, that's a worldly concern. That has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Give the money back to Caesar. Let him do with it whatever he wants to do with it. Then the Sadducees come to Jesus thinking that they can catch him uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a conundrum. The Sadducees did not believe in any kind of personal or meaningful afterlife. They were very sad, you see. And so the Sadducees think that they are all clever, and they come to Jesus and say, okay, there's a guy that has a wife, and he dies without children, so she marries the next brother, and he dies without children, and so on, and so on, and so on, until all the brothers have died, and there's no children, and then the wife dies. Okay, if there's a resurrection, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? Ha, 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 ha. And of course, this is a stupid question. Um, Jesus basically says there's no marrying in the afterlife. Uh, we're all free agents. No, it's not like that. Um, we are all uh, gl in glorified bodies. We'll be like the angels. The angels have glorified bodies. The angels will not be having sexual relations. There's no sexual relations in heaven. You don't understand the way things work in the kingdom. And of course, uh, th this story uh, sounds a little bit like uh, um, the, the law of leveret marriage in Deuteronomy a little bit, where if an older brother dies without children, then the younger brother helps him uh, have children uh, through by marrying the, the wife of the older brother and so forth. Um, I'll stop there. But basically, the Sadducees aren't nearly as clever as they think they are. And this is often the case with, with skeptics uh, who think that they know, um, they have pat, pat arguments they think make sense when perhaps they haven't just pushed far enough. Anyway, finally, then somebody asks, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments, all the commandments of God rest. And in this case, the response is, good answer. Um, and uh, at one point in, in one version of the story, Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. By the way, this isn't, uh, in, in my opinion, this isn't the greatest commandment. This is the commandment. This is the only commandment. All the other commandments of God are subsumed within this. There is no commandment that stands outside of the love of God. Um, all the commandments are subsumed within the love of God. The love of neighbor uh, is subsumed within the love of God. Now, there are some commandments uh, that have to do with loving God that are beyond the love of neighbor, but no commandment uh, is outside of the love of God or, the love, uh, or, or is contrary to the love of, of neighbor. And so I don't, I, this is the commandment. This is the only commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And part of that commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And part of that commandment is thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. These are all part of the love your neighbors yourself. Um, and so there is no other commandment other than loving God and loving neighbor. This is the all expectation. Every expectation of God for humanity is subsumed within those two commandments. Well, finally, Jesus says, well, while you're asking, why don't I ask you a question? You know, Psalm 110, 1 says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Who's David talking to? You seem to think that the Messiah is David's son, and yet David already calls him Lord, as if he already exists before David. Who's David talking about here? And they're like, what? I don't know that. Ah! And so, uh, they're stumped, and they stop asking him questions after that last one. So these, the story does go on on Tuesday, but there are the main debate points of Tuesday on Passion Week, where some of the religious leaders think that they're pretty smart, but they find themselves bested by Jesus in debate.
This is the Passion Week, and this is the Tuesday of Passion Week.